Avenue Road. The point being that Toronto's my second home. Uh, I was born in Montreal. Went to, um, bagels, smoked me. Uh, and uh, and uh, then came to Toronto and spent uh, several years living and working in Toronto. And, um, and so when I come back, to Toronto, and it's been a while since I've been here. All the memories of what I did when I left McGill, I graduated from McGill, and came uh, pretty quickly uh, to Toronto. I went to Ottawa first and was a professional actor in, in Ottawa. It was called the Canadian Repertory Theater there, and it was, I think, the only professional theater in Canada. And then from there, came to Toronto, and I was alone. I knew nobody here. And in those days, Toronto is, wasn't anything like it is today. They had blue Sundays, nothing was, nothing was open. Movie theaters, restaurants, everything was closed. And, uh, and I, I died of loneliness, and I was just, I, I didn't know that I'd make it as an actor, and, and it was cold, it was so damp and cold in Toronto. And I lived, I lived in a five-flight uh, little room up on the, the names are beginning to like Ger, Gerard 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 No, it's Gerard. You're pronouncing it incorrectly. <laughs> and on Gerard Avenue, uh, somewhere near where the CBC was, on Church or something like that. So I lived uh, in a room the, the size of this chair <laughs> with a bed that had a rope, it had interlaced rope as the, ma as the mattress. And, and I would get out of there as quickly as possible because it was so depressing. And there was a hotel on, what's, name me a couple of streets that are on church and now between Jarvis, one over. What was that? It was a French name. What? Sherbourne. I've been trying to think of the name of the street. It's kept me up for three nights. And I was on the like, what is it? What is it? Sherbourne. There was a hotel Sherbourne. Hotel Sherbourne, where. You could get all, you could, for a dollar or two or three, all you could eat for dinner. So I was so broke that I wouldn't eat anything all day and end up at the Sherborne Hotel and stand in line with all the guys, all, everybody who needed to eat all they could eat with their families and everything for two or three dollars. And, and you could just pile your, with all the potatoes that they had. And so I was able to exist from 6 to about 8.30. It was a family hotel, all you could eat. Like you came in the lobby, on the left-hand side was the cafeteria. On the right was a bar. And it was closed from 6 to 8.30. At 8.30, the bar opened, the cafeteria closed. The hotel changed character. In the bar, girls of the night were working. And I had nowhere to go. I didn't know anybody. I, had this, I didn't want to go back to that room. So I would sit at a table with the girls. And they'd leave the table and go upstairs and come back. Continue the conversation. And I made some of my best friends. The girls of the night. The one story that I remember, though, which was still stays with me, you'll understand why. So, for three, four months, as I, as in desperate loneliness and trying to find work in Toronto, I made friends with these ladies, and then I got busy and I met people and I 
wrote some shows for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and I met the girl who became my wife on one of the shows I wrote for the CBC. So now I've got this other life. I've got this girl who, whose parents lived in that rich section of town, okay? I've moved up, and I go to Stratford, and I become a Stratford actor, and, and, and I ask this a beautiful girl to marry me, and she says, yes, they're gonna have a big wedding in, up in that uh, section of town. And now, one day, one evening, we're in a theater on Young Street, we come out of the theater, my two prospective in-laws, the mother and the father, and the girl, okay, and, and, and my, the girl became my wife. And we're waiting for a car. And there comes a lady of the night walking the street, on Young Street. And I see her, and she sees me. She was my best friend for, for months. And I see her, and she looks at me, and I look at her, and without a sign of recognition, so professional, she walks by. And I'm like, what do I do? Do I say hello? And how do I explain that to my in-laws, prospective in-laws? And she leaves. And as she gets to the edge of the light of the theater, she turns around, and she looks at me, and I look at her. And in that moment, I could have said, hi, I've forgotten her name now, but hi, Rosie, I'm so good. Anything to have indicated the friendship, the gratitude I felt for her and her friends, for saving my life during those terrible months, I didn't say a thing. I was so ashamed, embarrassed, and um, I didn't know what to do with these new in-laws, prospective in-laws. So I didn't do anything. To this day, I think of that with regret, that I wasn't true to myself. And so when I come to Toronto, every time I come to Toronto, all these places have memories for me. Downtown uh, Toronto, which I haunted because there was nowhere else to go, and, and uh, uh, striving to find work at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. All of Toronto has memories, both good and sad for me. And here I am talking to you this afternoon. And then, wow. So. So I think we're set up for questions, are we not? Uh, where, where, where are you with a microphone and a question? Uh, is, there a, is there a thing? Do we know? Do we have a hand? Do, is there no setup? Okay, I'll do it myself. Once again, raise a hand and ask me a question. Raise a hand. You gotta raise a hand, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay, ask me a question. Do I do my own what? Twitter. Do I do my own Twitter? You know I do. Now, I've got a lot of stuff going, all right? This whole social media thing. I'm gonna be on uh, a program called, uh, it doesn't matter whether I know the name of the program. <laughs> As long as I sit down and able to talk intelligently, uh, some financial program, okay? Because of the twittering I do, and the Facebook, and the and the, all of the social media that I'm I'm involved in. First, the premise is I know nothing. Right? I'm ignorant. I don't know quite how to do any of it. So I've got a really good guy who helps. me. So I say, this is what I want to say, and he, 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 get, he spreads it out. Literally, how to, I mean, it doesn't take anything to, to do a, a Twitter or a Facebook, but there's so much involved that I have help from Paul. So I'm going to appear on this program in a, three or four weeks like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I have no idea. I just know that this whole social media thing that for anybody over 25 is foreign territory, 
is really the sign of the future. I was at one of these uh, comic cons a while ago, and I was sitting at a table with three young guys. One was 12, one was 14, one was 16 years old. And the screams of fans deafening in the, in the, uh, in the audience were, were for these three guys, and I didn't know who they were. And they were looking at me, and they didn't know who I was. <laughs> so I said to somebody, who, who, who are these guys? And they said, they're the vines. The kids on the vines? I said, you mean they make wine? <laughs> no, these kids, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so they're like six seconds, right? Six seconds on the vine. It's not 140 characters in the, in the, in, in the, uh, Twitter. <laughs> it's all these names. They're very difficult to Vines for six seconds. You can't say goodbye in six seconds. <laughs> Hello, my dear. It's time that I... What? It's over. I, I'd like to tell you how many... Oh, you, what can you do in six seconds? They're famous. Twitter's 140 characters. You don't have time for any depth. All you gotta do is... Now, good to see you. Hello. My... It's so surface. I don't know. I'm going to start. Okay, so the, the, the media, the social media. I'm doing brown bag wine tasting, all right? I don't know whether any of you have seen them, but if you go to WilliamShender.com, you'll see <laughs> brown or aura television. They bought Brown bag wine tasting. I, I, I walk around with a brown bag of a, bo with a bottle of wine, and I do an interview with anybody. Man in the street, personalities in there. Pour a little wine, have a sip of wine, and what do you think of the wine? And tell me about the wine in your profession. So I've had, I've had guys who work on the streets tell me, well, this is good, it's like good traffic. It's flowing like traffic, and it's got a stoplight here. You know, how to describe the wine in what you do, and in the meantime, I'm able to talk to them. The 10 to 15 minutes, brown bag wine taste. I'm doing, Milf. It's a cooking show. Mothers, I'd like to feed. Is that great? So, I'm getting set. Calling in, they want to be on Milf. I've done Alton Brown. He cooked me. So the idea is, hey, Alton. Tell me how you started to be a chef, and tell me your mother or the person in your life when you were very young and you wanted, and when you decided to be a chef, when, how you decided you wanted to be a chef, how you decided that cooking was your was your calling, and give me the recipe of like your mother's recipe. So he cooked me biscuits and gravy. The most delicious biscuits and gravy I ever had. And the story of how he got the biscuits so good. He said, my biscuits never could be like my grandmother who brought me up. He said, so not so long ago, I went, I said, look, Grandma, I'm going to sit here and watch you make the biscuits. Because I'm not doing the right thing. So she said, all right, I'll tell you sit there. And she started to mix the dough, and then she started patting the dough. And she started patting the dough with her arthritic fingers, like this. And all of a sudden, that's it! I'm always doing this with the dough. She's got flat fingers, because she can't move her fingers. <laughs> and that makes a difference in the rising of the biscuit. I've solved the mystery of why my biscuits aren't as good as yours, Grandma, because of well, the way you're patting it. And it was this delightful story of his grandmother and the discovery, first of all, that she made such great biscuits and gravy to begin with, and why her biscuits were better than anybody else's as a result of what she couldn't do. So it's this kind of thing that I'm able to do online and this is what part of what I'm doing.
the social media. I'm coming out with a book in uh, about Christmas time called Hire Yourself. There is a real dichotomy in people who are over 55 who can't find the work they once had before the meltdown and the, the economic meltdown. So they're finding it hard to get a job like they used to have with a salary that they, that they used to have. And I'm saying in my book, hey, hire yourself. I interview a large group of people who have gone into business for themselves using the web, and, and I, I tell how they did it, and they explain how they did it. And in the back of the book is very practical stuff about how to get on the web and how to advertise yourself and how to advertise your skills. It's another thing. You can do it from home. It's a whole different world that, that people over, I'm saying 25, 30, 40 years of age don't know about. And here I am explaining something I barely have a grasp on. <laughs> but what an interesting way of going. Because I've been doing other people. I've been, I've been trading like Adam Carolla. You know who Adam Carolla is? Yes? No. Yes. Okay, good. So Adam Carolla is a comic and he's got he's been on in on the air, both in television and radio, for a long time. And he's got a very popular blogosphere. 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 Blo blog. He's got a very popular blog. Okay. So you ask somebody over the age of 25, what's a blog? And they say, well, it's a lump. You know, like something that sticks in the drain, and you got to put Drano down there. That's a blog. No. A blog is like an interview, which you used to get for free, and now they're charging for it. Because they sell this hour interview on something like Amazon or, or any of the app of them. So... I'm going to blog to the over 55 group so that this book, the self-help book, becomes part of the blog. But then it struck me that nobody's blogging for the very young. I mean, I've got grandkids, eight, nine, ten years old, and when they're eating, they, 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 they can't get their eyes off their phone. They're playing games, they're doing things. Nobody's blogging for the pre-bubblegum people. Now, wouldn't it be interesting to talk to eight, nine, 10, 11 year old kids and find out what they're interested in and how to sort of guide them slightly if they would only read the blog. So I'm gonna experiment with this social media and try and move the, the, the fence the, the guidelines, I'm trying to move them out. And I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Does that answer your question about something? <laughs> All right. What's the next question? Yes, in the white there. In the red bandana? Yeah? You got a do out or do red? Oh, it's a hat. Okay, I got it. <laughs> nice loud voice so uh, he can hear you. Because he's going to tell me what you said. I said, why are you still doing episodes of Weird or What? Weird or What? <laughs> All right, so somebody explain this to me, okay? In the entertainment industry, like what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to sell a lot of shows. I got, I did a documentary, I hope some of you saw it, the play at HBO just recently about, called Chaos on the Bridge. Did anybody see it? Yeah! Oh, it got fabulous notices, it was on HBO, it was a documentary about the chaos that surrounded um, the first two years of, um, what was your question? <laughs> I want to keep the question in mind. What? Weird one. Okay. So, so, uh, so this. I had this. I sold the document 
I actually made the documentary before I sold it, which is unusual, and sold it to HBO, and they played it uh, a few days ago uh, to great success. And I was delighted with it. So that's, in essence, what I'm doing. I'm in business for myself, in effect. I used, I still I am available for, for parts and stuff like that, but, uh, and I did three movies uh, this year. But what I'm loving to do is do things like the blogosphere and the, and the, and the, the brown bag wine tasting and the, the, and the documentaries, uh, which is what I'm doing. And the uh, attempt is to get on the air and make it popular. That's what you're trying to do. So, several years ago, Canadian company comes to me and says, well, I'd like to do a show called Weird or What? And they explain the premise, and, and we're going to sell it in Canada, and it sounds good. And I said, great, great. And we'll film it in Los Angeles, and I get well paid for doing, you know, moderate amount of work. And uh, everybody's happy. <laughs> so it goes on the air in Canada, and very quickly becomes one of the more popular shows. I think it was in the top ten for a long time. There is a thing called the back end, which is different from what you mean by the back end, <laughs> which is if you're able to, you can share in the profit, which never appears. Actors get part of the back end. In fact, I've got a, a comic book, an interestingly new way of telling a comic book story illustrated novel, debuting October 23rd at the New York Comic Con. I'm, I'm introducing a Man of War Comics, which will be on television. It's a whole, I had an idea, and it's come to fruition, and it's happened, okay? So I'm trying to weave this, this story together and still keep in mind. So, so in that story, in, in that comic book, I have an industry on Mars where the workers who are mining Mars have been promised the back end. They'll get profits when the company goes into profit, and they never get it, and they're young. They're there 30, 40 years. The young revolt, and there's a rebellion on Mars, and that starts the whole comic book thing, because they never got the back end. So actors never get the back end. Star Trek, two billion dollars it made for Paramount. There were people who had a percentage of the back end. <laughs> never saw it. Oh no, we had problems, we got them profit, and there's none, and I had to pay, and it got, never see the back end. I saw profit. On Weirder One, they sent me a check on the back end. Not only was it popular, but it was making money. <laughs> and they canceled it. <laughs> if somebody can explain that to me. I kept saying to agents and producers, what happened? <laughs> it's what everybody aims to do. Get it on the air, get it popular, and make it profitable. We've done it all. And then it was canceled. Are you mad? <laughs> I don't know what happened to Weirdo World. I'm really weird. Right <laughs> How's it going? Well, right here. Well, well, somebody, Mr. Kirk. Oh, wait. <laughs> You produce a microphone. That's right. How weird is that? <laughs> Where did you get that microphone? You handed it to me. A galaxy far up. A, a, a galaxy far, far away handed you. It's the wrong show. You know. <laughs> although, although nobody told J.J. Abrams that, did they? You have two questions. First question. First question. 
Star Trek. Yes, I know it. Who was your, who was your, who was your favorite person to work with? Who's my favorite person? George Takei. <laughs> you know I'm joking, right? He's crazy. I don't know what's the matter with him. I don't know the guy. He keeps darkening my name. I don't understand him. I don't know him. He keeps saying, well, I know I've known him. I haven't seen him in 50 years. What's his problem? Okay. Uh, what's a, Leonard. Leonard Nemo's been a, a dear soul. Okay. Second question. Second question. I'm from your hometown, Montreal. What's that again? I'm from Montreal, where you were from. Yes. <laughs> Say the question. Uh, your, that, your, wait, your, wait a minute, that was a statement. No, 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 no. Okay. No, what do you mean, no, no, no? That was a statement. <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have the right to a third question, but I mean, no. no. Second, second. Oh, second one. It's like that guy rubbing the, uh, the genie thing, yeah. you know? What was your address where you lived? What? What was the address where you lived? Wait a minute. One more time. What address, what street did you live on? I lived on Mars Hill Avenue. Oh, Bill Mars Hill, I was part of the Mars Hill gang. <laughs> Peanuts, uh, Guy Lafleur, uh, oh, Doris, Doris Sweeney, Doris Sweeney. Remember Doris? <laughs> she was blonde, she was about 12. We used to play football and I'd tackle her every time I could. We played uh, with the chestnuts. You ever do the chestnut thing? Yeah. On Mar so you, you hit the chestnut, you know, you're doing the chestnut thing? Yeah. Uh, what do you call them? Knockers? Oh, Doris had knockers. <laughs> and uh, then we had BB guns. And, and to this day, I don't know why we didn't hit somebody in the eye. Well, I guess nobody was a very good shot, so <laughs> we didn't kill each other. Marcel Avenue, the Marcel Gang. Learn to speak French there. Je parle français. De le sourire. Jamais dans l'école, mais maintenant, j'ai perdu tout mon français. No? Did I qualify me? All right. Marcel Gang, and uh, then we moved. Uh, then my parents moved to uh, to uh, Hampstead. I went to West Hill High School. Doesn't belong in it. Isn't, uh, isn't there anymore, but I went to public school on Terrebonne, down in Monklin. Monklin Theater. Did you ever go to the Monklin Theater? It's where I went to see all the movies. Did you go to that drugstore where they had like all the sodas and things like that? It doesn't, it isn't there anymore. That was my, that was my youth. I used to walk to school. Ten blocks from Marcel to uh, to the Terrebonne Public School, and play King of the Hill on the bunkers where they put the coal, and, and they, I'd get knocked off and I'd knock people off. Then I'd have a fight every other day. Two guys would jump me; it didn't matter, and I'd fight for a while and run home. <laughs> and then, uh, and then what else? Uh, then I got, I got involved in football at West Hill High School. And we became the city champions for, we were a dynasty. Like the whole four years I was there, I was the best man on the second team. <laughs> and one time they sent me in with a play and I ran in and I tripped on the line of the 10 yard line. It was so embarrassing. At the same time, I, I, Somehow my mother got me to to a children's uh, dramatic school. Dorothy Walters and Violet. Dorothy Davis and Violet Walters. Dorothy, remember Dar Dorothy Davis and Violet Walters? <laughs> I was eight, nine, ten. I went for quite some time. All I did was do plays and be on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation on radio when I was a teenager, uh, while playing football. And neither world knew what I was doing. I kept my football life secret, and I kept my acting life secret from the football world. 
and one day it all collapsed and I um, forgot what happened, but it was, wasn't pleasant. <laughs> hey, listen, I got a signal that I got to go. I'm just warming up, actually. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to sign autographs for a while uh, in the major room. Uh, so supposedly you know where I'm going to sign autographs, because I don't. <laughs> Maybe some of you will leave me there. And then tomorrow, uh, I'm here with photographs and signing on our, and then we'll have the best time with Patrick Stewart. I did, I did another documentary, I've done several, uh, did another documentary called The Captains. And uh, well, I'm so glad you like The Captains. Do see Chaos on the Bridge. It's, it's uh, Captains was my first documentary. Uh, Chaos, I think, is my tenth, and there's a progression in, in, uh, in ability there. And on The Captains, I sort of got to know much more emphatically uh, Patrick Stewart. I learned to love him. He is